Welcome to Haven Heights Baptist Church. Welcome to those who are here and welcome to those listening online. Just one announcement this morning before we begin. There will be no midweek service or activities this week. So no midweek service or activities this week. Let us take a moment to prepare our hearts for worship. Our call to worship comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 5. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome the light. The word of our God. And now we'll have the lighting of the Advent candle. Our scripture reading is from John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Christmas is the celebration of God sending his Son. The birth of Jesus makes possible eternal life for those who trust in his life and death. Without this gift of Jesus, our sins cannot be forgiven. Because God sent his son to this earth to die in our place, we see how much he loves us. The lighted candle reminds us of God's love for us. Okay, in Luke 2, 25 and 26, it says, Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Now, Jesus is our consolation, or the giver of all comfort. The birth of Jesus means we can have hope in this life, the hope for eternal life. The birth of Jesus means there can be peace between God and man. The birth of Jesus means there is a future, unfathomable joy. The birth of Jesus shows us how much God loves us. The lighted candle reminds us Jesus is our consolation. Please stand with me. Okay. 
wise men came from country far to seek for a king was their intent and to follow the star wherever it went no The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Will you pray with me? Father God, we thank you this Christmas for the gift of your Son, Jesus. We thank you that he is the humble king laid in a manger. We thank you that he is Emmanuel, God with us. We thank you that he is Jesus, the name who saves. We thank you that he is the Christ, the anointed one from you. And yet this morning we set apart time to thank you that he is the light. We thank you that Jesus is the one by which we see you. We thank you and we praise you that he has come to make you known. And we thank you and we praise you that he has come to illuminate the way to you. And this morning, we set apart time to thank you and to praise you that he has come to defeat the darkness. We thank you that he has come to make an end to our sin and that he has come to make an end to our shame and to our suffering. And we thank you that he has come in grace for our guilt. We thank you that he is the light who defeats darkness. 
This morning, we pray that we would see the light of your Son, Jesus. And we pray that your light would shine in our hearts this morning. We pray that the light of Christ would illuminate these wonderful realities of his coming. We pray for those this morning who say, my life feels more darkness than light. And we think of those who have lost loved ones. And we think of those suffering from diseases and pain. And we think of those who feel lonely and isolated. And we think of those who know distance with those whom they were once close. We think of those who are in the midst of difficulty and those who find this world dark. And Father, we pray this morning that this Christmas Sunday that you would convince us of your light. Show us Jesus in all of his brilliance and radiance. And so we pray that your light would shine forth from this pulpit. And we pray for our radio program. And we pray for those listening online. And we pray that all of us would see you. And we pray that you would illuminate the gift of your Son. And so would you open our eyes. And would you bless these next moments. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Let's continue with some worship together.
Today's scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verse 68. What we'll be reading is the prayer of a priest named Zechariah when he learned that Jesus was about to be born. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago, salvation from our enemies and from the land of all who hate us to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. 
And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High. For you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. The word of our God. The promise of Jesus. Please stand with me as we sing our last hymn.
slave is our brother, and in his name all oppression shall cease. Sweet hymns of joy in grateful chorus raise we let all This is Christmas Sunday, the Sunday before Christmas. The room is decorated. The carols were sung. Some of us even have on our Christmas outfits. And yet, for many of us this year, it simply doesn't feel like Christmas. This year, it just seems different. Nearly all of us will have a different Christmas gathering. Maybe it will be smaller, maybe for less time. Nearly all of us have had a Christmas party canceled. And some of us will miss out on seeing our loved ones. We know that Christmas is around the corner. And yet we feel this tension. We know that we are to be excited. We know that we're to be full of anticipation. And yet for many of us, it just doesn't feel that way. And so in this tension, I want to give a word of hope this morning. If you feel this tension, if you say, I know this is Christmas, but it just doesn't feel that way. I know that it's Christmas, but it doesn't feel right. If that's you this morning, there is a word of hope. And that word of hope is this. That tension is biblically normal. It's biblically normal. To say that I know I should be full of excitement and anticipation, but it just feels off. It's normal. It's normal to say it feels off. It's normal to say that the things of this life just aren't all that they could be. You see, in the Bible, God's people are described as strangers and wanderers on the earth. God's people never feel quite at home, and they never feel quite comfortable, and they're always yearning for this comfort and this peace and this promise of, of hope, and yet it just seems elusive. That's normal for God's people. And yet, praise be to God that this tension will not always be our experience. This tension will not always be our experience. If you have your Bible, I invite you to turn to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah is a prophet. A prophet is one who speaks for God. And Isaiah is writing some 700 years before Jesus is born. And Isaiah is a man who is yearning for the one who will remove this tension. Isaiah is yearning for the one who will bring about better days ahead. Isaiah chapter 9. Beginning in verse 2. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. 
You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have scattered the, the yoke and burdens of them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. But for us, a son is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing it and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Isaiah speaks of this coming light. And Isaiah speaks of this coming child. And Isaiah speaks of this coming king and this light, this child who will become a king. This light will change everything. This light is so anticipated because this light, this king, will bring about the reversal of all that Isaiah experiences now. This light will overcome his dark world. That's the hope of Christmas. That's what we long for this Christmas. We long for the king who was the baby, who is the light, who will illuminate our dark world. That is our hope this Christmas. That's our hope because we feel the clouds of darkness. In a survey just last month, over half of Americans, 58% to be exact, 58% of Americans said 2020 was the worst year of their life. That's darkness. Divorce, abuse, loneliness, depression, all increasing. That's darkness. Cancellations, losses, closures. That's darkness. We sense the darkness. And Isaiah writes, as a man in darkness, and yet as a man yearning for the light. Now, before we can understand the light, we have to understand the darkness. And the only way to understand the darkness is to go back to the beginning. Genesis chapter 1, God creates all that is. And then in Genesis chapter 2, God creates man, and God places man, Adam and Eve, in the Garden of Eden. And they are perfect, and they are pure, and they are happy, and they dwell with God. And Adam and Eve live with one rule. They're commanded not to eat from the tree in the center of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And if we know the story, or if we know human nature, we know exactly what they did. They did the one thing they were commanded not to do, and they eat from this tree. And what God had said happened. Their eyes were awakened for the first time. And the children of light saw darkness. For their sin, they're banished from their home. And they become strangers and wanderers, sojourners away from their home. And yet God is ever so gracious. We dare not miss the graciousness of God this morning. In Genesis chapter 12, God comes to this one man, and he makes him a promise. And God tells this man, Abraham, I'm starting over with you. God tells Abraham there's going to be a new start. You're going to be a father. And Abraham, you're going to have children, and your children will be a blessing to the earth. And that's remarkable. Because through Adam, darkness has come. That's a curse. But through Abraham, blessing and light will come. God tells Abraham, it's going to be through your family that I'm going to bring light into this darkness. And it's a big deal. It's amazing. It's astonishing. And the Bible recounts that all the offspring of Abraham receive this promise. Each generation, God promises to bring light into the darkness. And then God leads his people into the promised land. 
And it's a good land. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. And in this land, God draws near to his people. And God dwells with his people in the tabernacle. And the priests, men, now have access to God. And it's almost a return to the Garden of Eden. God's people now know the blessing of a good home. And God's people now have access to God again. And God gives these people a covenant. That's a promise with a condition. You can stay in the promised land as long as you remain faithful to me. And if we know our Bibles, or if we know human nature, we know that they did not remain faithful to God. And so again, God's people are banished. And God allows these Babylonians to come in and to conquer them. And to lead Isaiah and his people away from their home. They take them into exile and they encounter the darkness. And it's the story of Adam and Eve on repeat. The story of Adam and Eve repeated again. And we know the story. Genesis chapter 3. God's people, Adam and Eve, are banished from the Garden of Eden. And life outside of the Garden is dark. In Genesis chapter 4, Cain kills Abel. It's a picture that darkness is only growing. And then Genesis chapter 6, darkness has increased so much that God has one option, and that's to destroy the darkness. And so he floods the world. And then God saves one man, Noah, and his family. And Noah gets off the boat, and to our horror, we see that the people of God are set on darkness. In Genesis chapter 11, the people of God, they want to be God. It's utter darkness. And they build this tower to prove that they can be like God. And they say, we can do anything that God can do. And look at this tower. We are now on God's level. And do you remember what the tower is called? The tower in Genesis chapter 11 is called the Tower of Babel. The tower is named after Babylon. And in the Bible, Babylon is always the place of darkness. At Babel, God confuses their language. And the people of God are scattered. And they're moved away from their home. And at Babel, they can no longer communicate. At Babel, there's disruption. At Babel, there's no understanding. At Babel, there's major setback, losses in literature, technology, and family. And everywhere you looked at Babel, there is loss. And at Babel, there is only darkness. And it's the same thing for Isaiah. And if we know our Bibles, we know that it's the Babylonians who come in and conquer him. The Babylonians, the people of darkness. And Isaiah knows what it is to be away from his homeland. And he knows what it is to have disruption. No understanding, major setback, losses in every way of life. And everywhere Isaiah looks, there is darkness. And it's in this utter darkness that Isaiah speaks of the light of the world. And Isaiah says, we have seen the light. And the great light that Isaiah speaks of, it's a pinprick, a pinprick of light in a sea of darkness. Isaiah, the man who knows darkness, the man who's away from his home, the man who knows disruption and loss and chaos. Isaiah speaks of the light that is coming in the darkness. Like Isaiah, many of us feel the darkness this morning. We feel the loss. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's a loved one who's passed. Maybe it's a job. We feel the confusion. Who hasn't asked, why is this happening? We feel the disruption. Everything just seems off. And yet the message of Christmas is this. Into the darkness, the God of heaven speaks. That's what we remember this Christmas. We remember that the God of heaven comes to the people in their darkness. And 2,000 years ago, God came to this little girl named Mary. Mary's probably 13, maybe 15 at the oldest. 
And God sends an angel. And this angel comes to Mary and says, you're going to have a son, and, and he's going to be the son of God, and he's going to be the Savior. And Mary is about to have the son who's going to be the light of the world. Mary is going to have the son who's going to be light into the darkness. The one who's going to illuminate the way for God's people to go home. The one who's going to illuminate God himself. The one who's going to shine his light into our hearts so that we can know peace with God. And Jesus is born. And it's the first Christmas. And as we read in our scripture reading moments ago, the light has come. The whole life and mission of Jesus was to bring light into the darkness. In Matthew's gospel, when Jesus is about to begin his ministry, Jesus begins his ministry by quoting Isaiah 42. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. And Jesus is referring to himself. And Jesus is making it unmistakably clear, I am the light that is coming into this dark world. And Jesus says, I have one mission, and that's to be light. And if we read the Gospels, we see that Jesus is the light. No one else lives like Jesus lives. He's the light. Jesus doesn't live for stuff, or he doesn't live for fame. Jesus perfectly loves God. And he perfectly loves others. Jesus is the light. He knows God, has a knowledge of God that no one else has, and he even speaks for God. And not only is Jesus the light, he brings light to others. Jesus heals the blind man. And it's a picture that Jesus is the one who brings sight and light to others. Throughout the Gospels, it's just unmistakable. Jesus is the light. And his sole mission is to bring the light to the world. And yet for all of his light, he wasn't accepted. His light wasn't accepted because John tells us plainly, men love darkness rather than the light. For three decades, Jesus' light shone in the darkness. And yet even when his light was shining, it so oftentimes seemed that darkness was winning. The light of Christ was despised and rejected. And then as Luke puts it in chapter 22, the hour of darkness came. And John tells us that the betrayer went out into the night. And under the cover of darkness, the Son of God is captured and taken prisoner. And to our horror and yet amazement, the Son of God is nailed to the cross. And as he hangs on the cross, creation itself echoes what is happening. In the middle of the day, when the sun is supposed to be at its peak, darkness covers the land. And by nightfall, the Son of God lay dead in the tomb. But then on Sunday morning, when it is still dark, the women approach the tomb. And when they get to the tomb, they see that the light has dawned. Jesus was not in the tomb. Jesus was alive, and the light has overcome the darkness. And this is the reality in which we live. Isaiah predicted the light. The light has come. The light was rejected. And then it seemed as though the life was about to be snuffed out, but then the light triumphed. Light predicted. Light came. Light snuffed out. Light triumphed. And yet we say it still feels dark. That's the New Testament. And that's actually what it means to be a Christian. To be a Christian is to be aware of the light, and yet, as Ephesians 6 tells us, to endure the present darkness. To be aware of the light, and yet to endure the present darkness. And so like Isaiah, we are longing for the light of Christ. This Christmas, we find ourselves in the same spot as Isaiah. We find ourselves saying, the light has come, it has dawned, and yet we long for it. This Christmas, we find ourselves in the same spot as Adam and Eve. And we find ourselves realizing this world is not our home. 
and realizing that we are strangers and sojourners on this earth waiting for our heavenly home. If there's one blessing of COVID, the one blessing of COVID would be this. It has made us realize that this world can never satisfy. You know, so oftentimes we're like hamsters on a wheel. You know that little wheel that the hamster has in its cage? The hamster runs on the wheel because the hamster thinks, hey, I'm eventually going to get to where I want to go. And that's why they run. They think that endless wheel is going to take them somewhere. And so oftentimes we do the same thing. And if things aren't working out, we just find ourselves running faster and faster. We purchase more and more things to be happy. Bigger TVs, better cars, faster, faster. Things aren't working out at our jobs. We work longer hours, faster, faster. Things aren't going well at home, so we buy them more stuff, faster, faster, and faster, and faster, and faster. And we think that we're getting somewhere. And then came COVID. And COVID's taken us off the wheel. And COVID has made us realize this world can never satisfy our soul. COVID made us realize that we are strangers and wanderers. Made us realize that we are longing for the light. Made us realize we're longing for the light of life who can lead us home. And the great promise of the Bible is that it won't always be this way. The great promise of the Bible is that Jesus will one day completely snuff out the darkness and that the light of life will indeed lead his people home. And we see this in Revelation 18. We see that Jesus will come again. And when Jesus returns, he's going to defeat who? He's going to defeat the city of Babylon. And when Jesus comes, in Revelation 18, he comes to defeat the city of darkness. And the enemies of God will be eliminated once and for all. And then what happens to the people of God? They're led to their new home. Led to a new home. Welcome to the place where God dwells. Welcome to the home that is perfect. And this new home, Revelation chapter 21, we notice the most amazing thing. In our new home, the new city, the holy city of Jerusalem, there will be no night. There will be no darkness. The Lord will give his light, and darkness will be forever gone. That's our longing this Christmas. We long for the light, the light that's already come. We long for that light to overtake all things. And this Christmas, we find ourselves just like Isaiah Longing for the light of life. In just a moment, we're going to sing Silent Night. And many of us know the lyrics to that song. Silent night, holy night, all is calm. You know, in many ways, that song is a misnomer. It seems as though that night was a night of darkness. Mary and Joseph have been uprooted, forced to leave their town in Nazareth to travel to Bethlehem. They get to Bethlehem only to find that Bethlehem is teeming with Roman soldiers, teeming with their enemies. And Joseph's forced to pay this tax that he doesn't have money for. And this town is overcrowded, confusion everywhere, and resources are probably running scarce. And Mary's getting ready to give birth to the Son of God, and there's no place. And so she gives birth among the animals. It seems as though it's a night of darkness. And yet we're going to sing, silent night, holy night, all is calm. And we're going to sing that because we will also sing, all is bright. And why is it all bright? 
It's all bright because there before Mary and Joseph lays the light of the world. That's what we reflect upon this day. And when we see the light of Christ, then our lives can be calm. You know, there's just so many pressures right now. We can be honest about that. And there's relationship pressure. And there's financial pressures. And there's even the pressure of just preparing for Christmas itself. And yet because the light has come, or because the light has come, we can be calm. There is darkness out there, but because the light has come, I can be calm in here. Calm in here because I know that light always overcomes the darkness. And calm in here because I know the light that has already come is surely coming again. And calm in here because I know that when the light comes, the darkness will flee. Let's sing. you stand with me. You may be seated. Let's pray. Father God, this Christmas Sunday, we thank you for the light of your Son, Jesus. 
And Father, we pray that as we leave here, we pray that you would remind us that light always overtakes the darkness. And we pray that as we leave here, that you would fill us with your hope. Cause us to remember that you are coming again. And so we say this Christmas, come Lord Jesus, come. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Now hear this benediction from John chapter 1, verse 5. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. We have heard of the light this morning, and so go believing in the light, and go believing that the light will only shine brighter, and go believing that the light will one day overtake the darkness. You are dismissed.